My presentation is always a little bit of a celebration of flight, and what celebration of flight would be complete without fireworks? <laughs> I always like to uh, start out by um, bragging a little bit. Uh, I, I am the world record holder for paper airplane distance. I broke the record uh, in 2012, and that got me uh, a shot on Conan, who um, appears to be a real jerk, but the guy is the nicest guy on the planet. He, he's really fun to work with. And if you've not seen the world record throw, here it is. There it is. There it is. We are all over that one. That's going to do it. Get up there. 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 <laughs> We were a little bit excited that day. Uh, so what you're going to see is a lot of things that kind of led up to breaking that record, sort of my journey of discovery about paper airplanes. And the first important thing is uh, the difference between a dart and a glider. And since all my planes are folded from single sheets, they all weigh exactly the same. They all weigh 2.2 grams. So the difference really is wing size. So that idea is called wing loading, the difference between um, wing size and the, how fast the plane will fly. So this is a dart flies pretty fast, and this is a glider, a bit slower. So if you could throw those back up here, just go ahead and throw them back forward after you take a look at it. Uh, I'm here all weekend, and I, it's about eight hours to fold a whole set of planes, so just throw them back up front when you, you know, if they land out there. So you may have noticed that those wings were different aspect ratio, and so it's nice throw, good job. Who was that? Raise your hand. Nicely done, sir. Whoa, another good throw. So even if you have wings that are different size, but still the same aspect ratio, it holds true. This is the max lock. Nice broad wing glider. Sorry, that was a little bit of a cheat. I knew that one was coming back. And this is the stealth dart. Now again, the difference in the speed is based on the size of the wing. Here's a close look at the stealth dart. One thing to notice here uh, on the stealth dart is it's got this curved trailing edge. Now, that helps it be more slippery through the air. That's an idea called low drag. You want really low drag for an efficient airplane. The way to make a curved trailing edge is to have a crease. Whoops, back up one. The way to have a, a curved trailing edge is to make a crease that starts at the leading edge and goes about halfway back. And as long as you don't go all the way back, you'll end up with that nice curved trailing edge on the plane, and that helps it be a little more slippery through the air. Now, the max lock that you saw fly just a moment ago, here's the big feature on that. It's a locking plane. The nose of the plane is locked together, and it's completely seamless on the nose. You'll get better. You'll get better. It always gets better. Whoa. That's, uh, it's now designed to do stunts. This particular airplane is called the Ultra Glide. Now, I stole, borrowed, sorry, borrowed, the uh, nose lock uh, technique from Takua Toda, who's the world record holder for time aloft. Uh, and again, if you lock the body of the plane together, you get a plane that glides a little more cleanly. No crunch catching. <laughs> Let it land. Throw it back. Go ahead. Let's see what you got. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Come on. Ooh. <laughs> Sir, if you're looking at your phone, how can we not hit the back of your head? <clears throat> Nicely done. That's how you do it right there. Uh, this is uh, called the Starship Shuttle. It's an aircraft uh, that I was just going a little bit crazy with. Now, again, no cutting or gluing or taping or any of that. I was interested in doing a cab over design and also a stair step wing. Uh, and when you get all done with that, it does actually fly. You guys thought I wasn't going to throw anything over there, didn't you? The stage is not that far. It doesn't really need a big arm for that one. Uh, this is called the Twin Jet. More accurately, it should be called the Twin Nacelle. Now, those aren't actually jet engines, those are just uh, the engine coverings. Still working on the ducted fan turboprop folding technique. Um, it is a fancy bit of origami, but it does fly pretty well. The twin jet. Now, I like to include in every book one plane that is basically impossible to fold. Uh, if you look at the circular nose, that would be just enough of an achievement by itself, right? But then it flares back to this sort of stair-step wing shape, and I, I will just warn you now, you'll buy the book, you'll go, I'm going to tackle that. That's what, don't do this one first, okay? Get a little folding experience. It does fly, though. It's, it's incoming. Twin jet. Oh. Now, I mentioned earlier all my planes are folded from single sheets of paper. 
That's not in, let's go ahead. Oh, yeah, we can look at it first, then throw it back, sorry. Ha! Uh. Good job, good job on the ring, uh, the ring thing. That's a, that's a tough one to throw. As long as they sort of approximately get back, I'll be able to get them. So the interlock biplane. This is actually folded from two sheets of paper, and I figured out how to do the interlock biplane after I did this plane, which is the interlock dart. Now, the interlock dart turns into a really nice airplane. You can see it's kind of locked together in the nose there, and it's... It is a great flying plane, and I discovered that if you take the flaps from one guy and put it into the pockets of the other guy, you can actually make an aircraft that's two of them stuck together that actually, it has about the same wing loading, so it has about the same speed, so it's a really cool plane. This is a plane I'm particularly proud of. This won a distance competition a few years back, and the trick with this particular competition was you had to ship your planes all the way to Spain. Now, you would think, why does that matter? Well, here's why that matters. If you take an airplane that's flying pretty good, like that, go ahead and toss it back, right to me. You take that plane that was flying pretty good, you hand it to the FedEx guy, and he puts it in a box, and it rattles around inside the box, and even if the tail feathers just get bent that much, a plane that was flying good is no longer flying good. So, here's how you beat the FedEx guy. Step number one into winning the competition. You build a plane that has hexagonal tail feathers. Hexagon shapes, one of the most structurally sound shapes you can make. You find them in nature, in honeycomb, you find them in all kinds of high-tech sporting goods. And the cool thing about the hexagon shape is you can really beat on the back of it, even FedEx style, and it'll still fly great. The Starfighter. Good throw. That's a tough one to throw. This, this, is, kind of, this is just kind of fun. It's kind of self-explanatory. Somebody get nailed in the back of the head? It's, it's a maple seed, and it was devilishly difficult to figure out the intricacies. Like, in nature, everything looks simple, right? You'd think that would be easy, you just kind of make that shape, and it would work. No. <laughs> no. So this angle here ends up being fairly important, and this thick leading edge ends up being more important than I would have guessed uh, to get the thing to tumble correctly. And I worked, I labored mightily getting this angle correctly, and what it ended up being was simply starting with a strip of paper and, and tying a knot with a strip of paper. And that angle comes out perfect. So it's like, somehow, nature knew, right? <laughs> Speaking of uh, planes that spin, nobody ever thinks that'll fly good. <laughs> Convinced? So uh, this is um, a circular aircraft, and it's doing something that when most airplanes are doing at paper airplanes, it's very bad. It's built to spin as it flies. So when you throw it, you let it roll off your fingertips, and the faster it spins, the straighter it flies. It's a little bit like a bicycle wheel. It gets its directional stability from how fast it's spinning. Um, so, super fun. See, that was uh, spinning a little bit slower. It started getting squirrely fast. Starfighter right in the head. Oh. Good throw. I could one hand that one. Now, a lot of these planes, I kind of started in the origami world, and I was one of the first people to take all those origami tricks back to high-performance paper airplanes. And I will admit that every once in a while, the origami creeps back in too far. <laughs> Nobody needs a plane with a swan head stuck to it. That's true. But if you could, why not? <laughs> Nobody really needs a pelican plane either. That's kind of a fun one. This is a plane I like to call a spectacular failure. It did not start out to be the bat plane. It started out to be the seagull plane. And you can see I got the wing shape about right, but something really extraordinary happened when I threw it for the first time. You have to watch closely. Whoop, if I could not hit the table. There's like a whole room here, and somehow I managed to hit a table. See the wings kind of shake a little bit as it takes off? That had me puzzled. Just throw it back up on the stage anywhere. Just, just throw it back on the stage, guys. So that had me puzzled. It took me about two weeks to figure out what was going on with those wings. Once I figured it out, I knew I could make it with much thinner, lighter paper, so it would go slower, right? Wing loading makes it go slower. Light wing loading makes it go slow. So this is exactly the same plane 
Folded exactly the same way, only it's folded with phone book paper. Okay, so phone books. That's like a non-volatile means of information storage. First social networking idea, okay? So this is the same plane, folded the same way. <laughs> it's alive! Careful, guys. Really careful with that one. <laughs> Good throw. Not very many people can do that. Not very many people are gentle enough to do that, so nice work. Uh, so first, a uh, really disappointing thing about the plane is that the flapping does not help it fly. That would be really cool, right? I would have invented some kind of perpetual motion machine. So a um, couple of things going on. Uh, when the, where the most mass is on the plane, where the center of weight is on the plane, it's called the center of gravity. And if that's too far to the rear, the airplane has a tendency to climb. So when you look at this thing flipped over, you can see lots of layers toward the rear of the plane. So it's a little bit tail heavy. The other thing is the body of the plane is very flexible. So it wants to climb. So as it climbs, there's some aerodynamic pressure. The wings flex together at the apex of the climb. No more aerodynamic pressure. The wings relax, and then it falls and flies and stalls and flies and stalls and flies and stalls. So it's stalling all of the time. It is a terrible aircraft. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's pretty fun to fly. It's the bat plane. <clears throat> okay, that's not a paper airplane. That is, however, a very complex piece of origami folded from a single sheet. Take a close look, five fingers on each hand, eyes, nose, mouth, tongue, wings, horns, uh, legs. It's got a tail. Really impressive. Eight hours of folding. Perfectly acceptable to say, paper airplane guy, get a life. <laughs> Two words in my defense, jury duty. <laughs> I show that for a couple of reasons. I'm, I'm kind of a show-off, but uh, the other reason is more important. A lot of people give up on folding as a way to make great paper airplanes. I would say if you could fold that, you could fold just about whatever you can dream up in terms of a paper airplane. So, you know, don't give up on the folding. Now we can talk about ducks. Now, we're going to talk about canard designs. Uh, canard is French for duck. About 90% of the room probably knew that. Uh, these are three pretty famous canard designs. The Wright Flyer, the first powered, sustained, um, controllable flight aircraft. The Gossamer Albatross on the bottom there, that guy there, the first, one, uh, first aircraft to fly human-powered across the English Channel. And this guy is the Voyager, the first aircraft to fly around the globe nonstop without refueling. All of these planes have one thing in common, they have a little wing in front, and that makes them a canard design. Now, why is a canard design a big deal? It is the safest aircraft you can make, and here's why. If you angle this little wing at a slightly more upward tilt than the main wing, that's called angle of incidence, if you care, but if you just tilt it up a little bit more than the main wing, when the aircraft gets close to stall phase, the little wing will stall first, drop the nose down, and the main wing will never stall. So it is a stall-resistant aircraft. Now, the Wright brothers, nobody knew in those days uh, what, what caused a stall. All the Wright brothers knew is that everybody else who had died trying to figure out how to fly had put this horizontal stabilizer back here. They did it the opposite way. They moved it to the front. They accidentally invented the world's safest type of aircraft, which allowed them to survive the experience of learning how to fly. They kind of lucked out. So here's my canard design. Again, uh, no cutting or gluing, and it's got, you know, um, same kind of idea, I'm angling this forward wing, the little wing in front, at a slightly higher angle of incidence, and it makes it stall resistant, not stall proof. You see it, how it, easy, it noses over real easy there, instead of going into a main tip stall. Just throw that back when you get a chance. Ah, world record plane, finally, we get to the world record plane. I'm just going to throw it once to get that out of my system. <laughs> Good thing I got that out of my system. Um, so, a couple of interesting things about the world record plane. I started out by talking about the difference between a dart and a glider. This is the old world record plane, designed by Steven Krieger. This is my plane. Look at the size of the wings. That plane on the right was like a javelin, basically a stick with fins. He threw it at a 45-degree angle, it arced over, and three seconds later hit the finish line. My plane, if you remember the video, launched flat, climbed on its own, and then actually flew the last third, uh, acro flew across the finish line, smashing the old record by 20 feet. 
So the big difference is a dark glider idea. In point of fact, I mean, the old world record holder whined publicly to the Wall Street Journal about the idea that, we had, that I had used a thrower to throw my plane. My thrower couldn't throw it as far as Stephen. That's why we had to switch to a glider. <laughs> um, first of all, we don't know how things fly. I don't know if that's shocking to anybody else in the room. We don't know how things fly. You've probably been told you know, something like, uh, that involves this, this idea right here. But the main thing is big wings and little wings fly differently. Let's, let me just walk you through how you're usually told about how big wings fly. You're usually told that the air hits this leading edge and um, the molecules have to get from this edge to the trailing edge at the same time so the air on the top needs to go a little bit further so it needs to go a little bit faster and that, that's called the Bernoulli effect. And, and so the faster moving stream of air causes the low pressure which causes lift. That's complete hogwash. It's not true. Uh, so what happens, uh, in fact, if you put this kind of wing in a smoke tunnel and you have different colored smoke on top and the bottom, the smoke on the top gets to the trailing edge first. So there is no rule that says the molecules have to get there at the same time. That idea of equal transit that we've been told since elementary school is, is twaddle. It just, it's just wrong. So what could be happening is that the air hits the leading edge of the wing and gets slowed down by air friction. And it's, the air has a tendency to follow the shape of whatever it encounters. That's called the Coanda effect. So this Coanda effect may slow down the air a little bit, which then would cause a low pressure uh, system downstream of where it gets slower. And then it would rush in to that low pressure, like every other air system that you've heard about, low pressure and high pressure. High pressure moves to low pressure. So this sort of conforms the Coanda idea, kind of conforms with what we know about airflow and, and high and low pressure. So notice that in the two leading theories of flight, one says the faster moving stream of air causes the low pressure, and the other one says the low pressure causes the faster moving stream of air. Is that shocking to anybody else in the room? <laughs> the cause and effect is exactly backwards. This is a small wing. Now notice that there's turbulence right away with a small wing. Turbulent flow. So that occurs really quickly with a small wing. It's easier to get laminar flow with a big wing. Uh, the other thing that was uh, critical uh, with regard to the world record plane was an idea called dihedral angle. So dihedral angle is just the angle that the, the wings are attached to the body of the plane. Don't let the words scare you off. It, it just means if the plane will rock back to neutral better if there's a little higher dihedral angle. The problem is with dihedral angle, the more you do, the more drag you get. You don't get something for nothing. So you get a little stability, but you get a little drag too. So in a perfect world, you'd have a paper airplane that when it was traveling very fast, flat dihedral, and then as it slowed down and needed more directional stability, you could crank up the dihedral. Well, that's really tough to do with a paper airplane, but I figured out how. The world record plane changes its dihedral angle based upon the speed that it's flying. I have a very flat dihedral angle at the nose because when the plane is flying very fast, the air separates very close to the nose. So flat dihedral angle. As the plane slows down, the air can adhere further back. More dihedral angle at mid-wing, so now I've got more stability when the plane starts to fly slower. This idea of being able to change the dihedral angle based upon the speed the plane is flying had never been tried before with a real plane or a paper airplane. So that, that was the world record, um, world record idea, beating the old record by 19 and a half feet. Round number's 20 feet, but 19 and a half will, will be fair. Um, so when my planes are uh, not flying hundreds of feet and I'm at home and I'm, I'm kind of lazy, it's just nice to have a plane that does that. It's aircraft juggling, it's been outlawed in some states. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> now, most people guess when they see that happen for the first time that I've bent some left rudder in there to get the plane to circle left. No, that's not true. It circles left, it circles right, and if I throw it straight and avoid the lighting instruments, it'll do a loop. So how is it doing all of that? Just tell them I'm not here. I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> um, so how does it do that? A couple of things are going on. Remember we were talking about dihedral angle and how it stabilizes an airplane. You get a little, um, most aircraft, most paper aircraft, full-size aircraft have positive dihedral angle. That dihedral angle uh, adds a little resistance to side slip. It also helps get the center of lift up over the center of gravity. Those things are all good. Also, you get a little added moment of angle of attack when the plane rocks to one side you get a little more added angle of attack, a little more lift, it'll rock back to neutral. So the bottom line is positive dihedral angle, if I throw it leaned over, it's it'll just stabilize itself. 
and keep on flying straight. The boomerang plane has negative dihedral angle. The wings are drooping. So it will not right itself. If I throw it at a banked attitude, it stays in a banked attitude. And again, there are a few more layers toward the rear, so the center of gravity has shifted back on the plane. So it has a tendency to climb. So it stays leaned over, and because the center of gravity is a little bit aft, it just circles its way back to me. It climbs its way in a circle back. And it does that left, or right, or loop. It's all the same trick. It's just uh, climbing in a <laughs> precarious landing. All the same trick. So negative dihedral angle. The Wright brothers plane was a negative dihedral angle plane. So obviously, we've known about negative dihedral angle for a while. This is a fat glider. Another negative dihedral angle design, circles back. This is the LF-1 from Fantastic Flight again. Wings are drooping. Get it to circle back. So, oh, thank you. But what you really need, if you're the paper airplane guy, is a plane that flies out, oh, and crashes. No, that's not what you need. <laughs> real, real easy, just bring it back. Just, ooh, he almost got it to do it right there. Got to do it twice to make sure. It flies out, flips over, and flies back upside down, yeah. That's just not right. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> okay, so what's going on here? So it does a really crazy tip stall. So that means lots of layers toward the rear. So these things that look like landing gear underneath, that's just layers toward the rear of the plane. Also, super flexible center fold. Center crease, sorry, not center fold. Don't get excited. Center crease. So... It's allowing a positive dihedral angle on the way out, keeps it tracking straight. And when the plane stalls, look what happens, really flexible, so now it can have positive dihedral angle while it's upside down. So two flight modes, both with positive dihedral angle to keep it tracking straight. There's just a crazy tip stall in the middle. Um, I got interested in breaking Guinness World Records a while back, because um, the guy who had the world record for distance, I mean for time aloft, was selling a ton of books outselling me a lot. <laughs> and so I figured I need to go after a world record. Uh, so uh, I have lots of planes with as good a glide ratio as Ken Blackburn's plane. Um, his was like 18, 19, uh, about 17 to 1. Uh, so I, I got his book, folded his plane through it, and I went, ah, I'm in the hunt, man. I got planes that work this good. Then I went to YouTube and I watched Ken throw his plane. There's where the trouble started. Ken Blackburn's right arm is like a missile launcher. <laughs> Mine is more like a wet noodle. So I knew I was going to have to come up with a different idea for the time aloft problem. So I'm going to ask you guys to scoot back just a little bit right there from the front of the stage. Just scoot back. Just give me a little, enough room to just walk right there. Watch it. Yeah, just scoot back. Just a skosh. I'm going to fly right at you and make a turn. So just step back just a little bit. That way. Just that way a little bit. There you go. So this is my solution for the time aloft problem. I was going to make a lap around the room, but you got, we have too many people, sorry. It usually goes way to the back. Plenty of room for applause. Um, so what's happening with this plane? Uh, first of all, it's super light, made from phone book paper again, so that makes it uh, fly slow enough for me to walk behind, partially. And it's got a lot of crazy stuff. If you look at the trailing edge, uh, there's actually a downward bend and then an upward bend, so it's like a, an accordion move there. Uh, so I'm adding a lot of drag to get the plane to fly slowly. So, it, it's not a terrible uh, glide ratio, but watch how slowly it... If, come on, stop destroying your plane. Watch how slowly it sinks, almost parachute-like in its vertical descent. Ooh, nicely done. So it's, it's falling vertically so slowly that I can generate an updraft with this card that the plane will ride in. And here's how you do that. As long as I'm walking forward with the card, I'm scooping up air. As long as the top of the card's leaned back, I'm scooping up air. So I'm creating a little wave by walking forward. And as long as that air is moving up, the same speed the plane's moving down, it'll ride right there on that wave of air. I have another plane that flies that way. I love this plane. It doesn't look anything like a paper airplane. OK, you guys are about to, for you're kind of about to forfeit your amateur status. So you know, just by watching this one.
Whee! It's that tumbling wing. So that idea of flying an aircraft with a, uh, with a piece of cardboard that creates an updraft, that had been around since the 50s. I was the first guy to do a tumbling version of that, just because I'm insane. So it's got a, uh, one, one long edge is bent one direction, the other long edge is bent the other direction. It sort of spins backwards uh, with, uh, relative to the, uh, the direction that it's flying. So you can make them um, you know, a lot of different sizes and shapes. Uh, if you uh, Google tumbling wing, you'll see a lot of different uh, designs out there now. Uh, invented that in the 90s, so, but it's all over the place now. So you can make them different sizes and shapes. This one is really small. It's made out of tissue paper, like you might wrap a gift with. And this one is small enough that if you're careful, you can actually... <laughs> there's, there's no physics involved with this one, it's just magic. <laughs> it's a tumbling wing. All right, here we go. Everybody close enough who wants to take a picture of the screen? I'm serious. There, uh, yeah, you, can you do it from where you are? Okay, here we go. We start with a uh, sheet of paper, the short side up. You're going to make a diagonal fold, which means you're going to take the top of the page against one side. Everybody good? No. <laughs> We're not actually folding. We're just taking pictures of it. Unfold that. And make a diagonal the other way. Unfold that. Okay, now you've got a big X in the page. Now we're going to take one side of the page and put it against that diagonal crease. It looks like that. And then we're going to do the same thing with the other side. Everybody getting the photographs? Good. Oh, am I in your way? I'm right in this guy's way. Uh, now we're going to make a crease that goes right across the center of that X that we made. Boom. And you'll want to line up these creases on top with the creases on the bottom. Next fold, we're not making any new creases. We're following the old creases. Bang, bringing it down. And then we're just going to flip that flap up. Now. Um, in the spirit of full disclosure, Guinness rules allow one piece of 25 millimeter by 30 millimeter piece of light duty sticky tape, scotch tape. Uh, you can cut that into as many pieces as you like. I chose to cut it into 16 pieces. <laughs> Not showing that part today. So we're gonna, the easy way out is to just do this locking mechanism here. You flip it over, fold it in half. And the wing fold, this is the part that you really need to take a picture of. The wing fold is the most complicated part. So you're going to take, uh, you know, fold the plane so that it, there's an, uh, a crease that goes close to the nose and rakes up as it goes toward the tail. The way you figure out how much is you keep an eye on this raw edge here. As you fold it over, that raw edge is just going to touch the corner of the tail. Okay? That's the critical thing. You see how the wing goes past the bottom of the plane. Most planes you would just fold to that. You want to fold it so the wing goes past and you figure out how much by making this raw edge touch that corner. Then you do the other wing. Ah, positive dihedral angle. You can get the book or, or uh, go on my subscription website and get the precise um, angles for the dihedrals and the taping scheme and all that. Uh, this is American letter size paper, so you need to give it a little bit of up elevator. There it is, looking right down the nose. So just, uh, just in closing, Usually we do a mass launch at this point. I ran over on my silliness. Um, I come to Maker Faire and places like this for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason, uh, I'm a complete show off. I love showing off my planes. You guys already figured that out. Second reason is there are a number of global issues that are only going to have science-based answers. Everybody on the planet has to stay curious. We don't have any spare brains on the planet. We need everybody working on the, the global energy shortages, water shortages, food shortages, a little thing called global warming. No spare brains. We need, we need everybody thinking about this and working on it now. So thank you for coming to uh, Maker Fair. And again, a little fireworks to end the show. Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Thank you very much, John.